Hey, Mark. How you doing? Wow. Can never, you hear me okay? Yeah, it never goes this smooth. There must be something going on. Something bad's going to happen if it goes this smooth. Usually it takes a <laughs> Really? <laughs> I, I haven't Zoomed that much. Sue uses it all the time. So let me know if something's up. Is that her work on the back? Is that your wife's work on the your back? Uh, the one on top is Richard Schmidt. Yeah. And the one on the bottom is uh, a friend uh, that uh, Susan's father had gone to art school with in the 50s at the Art Institute. Oh. The drawing is, yeah. Her father had gone to the Institute? Her father had gone to the Art Institute uh, in the 50s, yeah. And uh, didn't, uh, you know, know how to make a living at, uh, you know, painting fine art. So he went into, like, advertising. And so he did kind of like... Um, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, like Mark, creative market. Like Mark, he was like kind of an in-between person where he would get products, make products for, for companies that wanted them, like T-shirts or yeah. keychains or whatever. And he would uh, get those made and then, you know, provide them to them and, you know, talk to artists. He knew lots of artists who were commercial artists and things. And so, yeah, in fact, that's how Sue found out about the Academy. Um he just signed her up when she didn't seem to know what she wanted to do in high school <laughs> for the Academy and said, hey, there's this. I know, I know a guy who teaches commercial art there at the American Academy of Art. Uh, you know, I signed you up for for class there since you don't have any plans after your senior year, and so wow. that's how she went there. Oh my God! Yeah. Well, I'll have to have her on sometime as well. We're talking about oh, yeah. Susan Lyon. That's your wife, who's also this remarkable artist who is oh, yeah. great figurative and drawing. And you know, she's yeah, she's I've seen her work. It's pretty phenomenal. And, and you're much more interested bad in either, by the way. And that's why we have Scott Burdick on today, <laughs> the Art Dealer Diaries. We just kind of jumped into it. You just got back from where? You were, we were in uh, Rome for a couple of weeks, yeah. uh, staying with uh, friends of ours, uh, a, a really wonderful um, uh, um, artist named Stephanie Birdsall and her oh, yeah. husband, I know who David is. Nichols. Uh, I had met David Nichols because he is a... Uh, He's a film producer. He was finishing a large film there. And uh, he, uh, uh, a couple years back, he had bought the uh, option on one of my novels uh, to make into a movie, which they're still developing possibly for uh, Netflix or somewhere. So, you never know. We'll see. All right. Well, talk, let's talk about that because I've written 10 novels. I've had zero <laughs> options. So <laughs> tell me about the novel. You, you've, I, I know you've written novels. Uh, in fact, I, I wanted to get one on a, as an audible or something and listen to while I paint. So, yeah. Yeah, there are, Yeah, there's like uh, maybe seven on audible and my latest one's coming that's out. that's exciting yeah i, I gotta download one I, I i listen to audible all day while i paint um oh, yeah. uh, although i have to admit most of the time they're they're more science history type books but uh i love good novels as well so yeah that's exciting they're two all, writers here talking yeah they're Forget all about art mysteries. yeah no, well yeah no it's a different kind of art but yeah they're all murder mysteries and yeah no so the next one's coming out i just got the final edit last night for my editor so you know now i'm into the get the blurbs and you know have a few friends and close people read it to make sure there's nothing goofy that i missed and then you know you know how did so, you start writing what got you interested in writing it to start with you know i always used to go to movies and read novels and murder mysteries and things and go oh i can i could do that i think and i loved tony hillerman and i just thought mm -hmm. hey, do it i think i can do it let me try it you know, I've never tried it, but yeah. I thought good. And I wrote, I spent one summer and I wrote one. And I go, yeah, that's okay. It's not great, but I can do it. And then let it sit for a couple of years. And then I came back and said, no, I really want to give this a go. And then, so I just started putting one out every few years. So, just like painting. You know, you, you do one and, and I'm the same way when I write a story or do a painting, I do it. I put everything into it. Then at the end, I'm I'm kind of down that it didn't come out as good. And so then you study more and you try and get the next one better and the next one better. And yeah. along the process, you learn a lot. So, yeah, and you do get better. I mean, my, you know, my first novel is not going to be as good as this 10th one, or at least I don't think it is. The writing's right. probably not as good. You just get more succinct of moving the plot along and, you know, you learn yeah. little things that you should do and look for and go, you know, show the action, not tell the action. Those just kind of typical things. And so what's the right. novel that oh, yeah. you, have you written more than one novel? I've written three. Um, I've written many, actually. I've always written since I was a kid and 
and then through high school and then after the art school i took creative writing and filmmaking in uh in, in at the columbia college while i was making make starting to make a living at as a painter uh so i've always written uh but i've written three that i've actually you know published um and uh, that one uh, that they bought the option for uh, that they're hoping to make a, a limited series on is uh, my second novel. And uh, it, uh, it's um, uh, called The Immortality Contract. So very fun, fun story. And I love writing them. Uh, I just write every, a couple hours every morning. I've always done that. And uh, most of what I write, I, I don't finish into into finish it up good enough or as a novel, but I, I don't know about you, but like for me, painting is kind of the same way where it's almost like an excuse to learn and explore. Mm -hmm. So when we when we go on, I mean, we can paint things and sell them, um, but it's so fun to say, let's go to let's go to, um, you know, India. Let's 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 drive across all of uh uh, Tibet, you know, let's go to Africa and trek in where the Messiah are living and there's no electricity, you have to camp mm -hmm. your way in. But wherever we go, and I like to explore and learn. So it's kind of like an excuse to learn. And that's how I see writing too, is I will, sometimes it's an idea for an actual story, like you're talking about a plot, right. but right. most often it's just things I'm interested in. And I, and I decide to create different characters. That's the way the mortality contract is. I have different characters of completely different viewpoints and, uh, you know, extremely different viewpoints on religion or on politics or on what philosophy or whatever it is. And then I have them have discussions. And so when they have discussions and I'm writing in the mornings and making these discussions, mm. I have to, and I may agree with one person or the other, but then I have to come up with the best argument for the other side. Right. And so that makes me research and research and research. And so then I, I come in and then as I may have these discussions and these arguments in my own mind, I, it's funny how sometimes I have to change my own view. You know, I, I learn things. I realize, wow, this isn't quite as simple as I thought, you know, ideas of morality or whatever like that. Or you right. say, what's a terrorist or whatever. And you start researching, you start going, wow, God, look at how this definition has changed over the years. And what, what, so that's what I like about writing and painting. It's kind of an excuse to like challenge yourself mm. uh, and world through different eyes and certainly that's uh uh what i love about about painting and going to places whether it's an indian reservation in south dakota where i lived with a family you know what right when i was at art, art right. school lakota tribe in south dakota and then you know say all the ones i've done with the navajo and just getting to know people and you know staying in the reservation and talking to them about their stories and their beliefs and their ideas and yeah. Their experiences, which is allows you as a writer to be able to get into their head and understand dialogue. It's Not just as a writer, as a person, you know, well, it's just to see the too, but, other eyes, you know. But I don't, I don't but know. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you can take the two away from each other, right? A writer and a person. Yeah, absolutely not. Say, right. I mean, you just. Well, and that's what's fun is I, I will record a lot of time, a lot of times I paint people. Uh, whether they're wherever they are, if they speak English or sometimes through through interpreters, I'll actually record people. I like to when I do their portraits, drawings or paintings, I'll record their stories while I paint them. And uh, those are very interesting because then when I listen to them back, uh, that that is very, I've used some of those stories in some of my novels. And it is so interesting to in the moment, you don't quite notice the speech patterns and the way people speak. But when you hear it recorded back, it's fascinating and you can start to put that into your story and then your characters really start to take on the mind of their own. And even if the story, the character in the story isn't really the same story or the same exact character that you've you've met and interviewed, um, just their thought patterns and the way they speak and express themselves, their view of the world, it starts to become a character to me. I can put it onto a character that fits a plot or whatever. And then it's almost as if when I write, once you've really built that and known, known people just like this and their backgrounds and what kind of makes them ticks, it's like they take a, a on a, a, a you know, a, you're, it's almost like you're just typing and you're just watching. You're 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 watching something. And you're ex excited about what's going to happen next. Yeah. And it's almost a surprise. And I have that same experience when I'm painting and I get to a certain point where it's kind of takes over. I come back the next day and I was like, 
why did, I mean, where did that come from? You know, why did I decide to paint this that way? You know, and I, I think that's what uh, is addictive. And I'm sure you felt this same thing because most writers that I know have felt this uh, same thing and painters where it kind of just starts to take over and almost feels like you're channeling something, you know, it's you pretty interesting. I think you are channeling. I mean, you can feel it. You can hear the voices. You can hear the dialect. You know who these individuals are. Yeah. In my case, often, if I'm really deep into it, I literally go into my dreams when I'm dreaming. I'm in the mo I'm in the book, the movie, whatever you want to call it. it you know, right. it, it's writing itself in front of me. So I think that's very true for me. And it, so this other component you have of writing has to affect both your writing and your artwork in a way that other people may not have. I could I can see that already that you're <laughs> you're recording these are these individuals that you're painting that's unique in itself i think and cool and i like that i think that's really amazing that you do that well that's what's fun is i know every painter that i know all these great painters you know they're they're saying something differently because they approach it a different way they look at yeah. the world different way they have different things to say and I, I i do i do often feel that a lot of my paintings uh, are a little more documentary-ish, you know, even if I change things or whatever, it's kind of based on me going out and finding inspiration. Uh, and occasionally I'll do that where I'll have an idea and I'll sit down and sketch out and have an idea for a painting, like a Norman Rockwell would have an idea. So he hires models to, to play the different parts and stuff. Or Morgan Weisling, one of my right. friends, favorite artists. Um, it's a completely different way of working uh, than, than what I do. I tend to go out, try to find some inspiration, and then then put it together as a painting or the same thing with stories, you know? And uh, and so it's uh, it kind of reflects just kind of almost just your personality and the way you want to see things. And of course, every artist is putting themselves into it, whether they feel they're doing a documentary or whatever. And I've done a few documentaries and stuff when I, uh, and, and those are interesting. Um, but there is no true just documentary that is completely dispassionate. You're choosing where to point the camera. You're choosing who to interview, what questions to ask. Right. And You're on bias. Kind of, too. Yeah. And, and so it's neat how people's, you can see people, their own, uh, you know, individuality come through in paintings like Richard Schmidt or my wife, Susan and I will go to the same place and we'll have a show of, we'd have shows of like Tibet or India or whatever. And people will come in and they're like, wow, you guys are like in the same place. And some of these are the same models and they look completely different, you know, of course they do. And it's not like <laughs> it's not contrived. It's just our way of seeing the world that's coming through. You know, it's a, that's what the famous statement is. A portrait is a portrait of the model and the artist. Mm -hmm. So, and, and when you get to a certain technical, technical level, that comes through where every you have a really bunch of great artists in a room together. Uh, like when we paint, when I painted with, with lots of my friends um, together, they're all great accomplished artists. Um, we will paint the same model and you just, you look at each painting and say, you see Jeremy Lipkins. Oh my God, that looks just like that. that. You look at, um, you look at uh, Logan Ajish, you know, when we went to this trip to Mexico, we're all painting the same model, right. this whole of us and yet they all look correct but then you look at them together and they all look completely different yes. uh, even though you can recognize they're the same model and that's what i love about all art forms whether it's painting or writing or filmmaking or whatever it is do you consider yourself a painter a writer or just would you qualify yourself as an artist I don't even know if I'd say artist i mean really i just think you're just a, a you know a person who is you know you're, you're using tools, the tools that you have to tell your story. Right. Now, it's interesting because, there, you know, there's some people, it's like you think of what is great writing, all right? Um, and it's telling a story that that touches somebody, and it's the same with a great painting. You've got to have that emotional reaction. Yeah, to that's something. right. And so you think, of, you think of like Mark Twain. One of his, at, at his lifetime, one of his most famous stories was, a, a story about a woman who worked for him was like a um, uh, uh, a, a housekeeper uh, who was black, who had been a slave and had 
uh, come through the war and he and he hired her and he he actually once had mentioned her you know you're always happy you know it's amazing how you have gone you're just you just don't seem to have you know felt the effects of all the things that have happened in the country and she said well let me tell you something I've never told you my real my story and so he just sat down and she did t she told her story in her own words she would say well I could never write my story because I don't I'm not I'm not literate I can't write. And she she just told her story and he just simply copied it down word for word. OK, and it became and it was beautiful in her word, her way of speaking, her dialect, everything. And it became this massive bestseller for for Twain. And of course, Twain would say this. I shouldn't be. I'm not taking credit for writing this. Right. So would you say that that lady is a writer, you yeah. know, or an artist? You know, she's telling a story now. Uh, Twain is considered an artist and he wrote artistic works of art. And yet that that work is right up there with with the things that he imagined. So I think that there is less of a divide between artists and non-artists than we often think of in this world, in this country. And I think a lot of people feel like we have this happen to us all the time where people will come up and tell us, um, oh, I wanted to be a painter, but I realized I couldn't make a living at it. Or somebody, I want to be a writer, but I'm sure I couldn't make a living at it. And so they don't do it. Right. And the majority, that's the majority of people, by the way. Yeah. And in, in some countries, though, we go to, I'm when we first went to China in 1999, uh, when we, we hired a translator and traveled there for a month. It was They had just started to let people travel without, without government minders. And uh, so many people come up to us and say, oh, I paint too, you know, but not, not to sell, but to prove myself, you know. And, uh, and I feel like people... People don't realize that just about everybody has that ability to express a story or an image or create something of beauty that's going to touch somebody else. Uh, and so the label artist, uh, to me, it's it's kind of a label of how I make a living. Mm -hmm. um, I've written for years and years before I, I made any money off of writing, and I still considered it just the same as I do now. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, so, yeah, so I don't know what I would call myself, really, just kind of a curious person who has right. luckily enough have the time because people support us and buy our paintings and some of my stories and things. I were lucky enough that that we have more time than other artists out there mm -hmm. uh, who, who have to spend most of their time you know, supporting their families or doing other jobs. Um, and which which there, there's probably a lot of art even in those things that they do. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, if you've ever seen somebody with a big backhoe that can take a two-ton boulder and roll it onto its side in a very precarious way as if it were just a little teeny thing, you know, yeah. that, that guy's an artist for sure. I mean, Absolutely, yeah. The ability to do yeah. that kind of 3D thinking and fine right. manipulative uh, work with his hands and doing the bowl. I just love to watch guys like that or girls either that are you know, have that ability mm -hmm. to do something so remarkable. Yeah. It's a land art, you know, is really what it It'll is. It'll stop you in your tracks and you say, wow, that's beautiful. Oh, the I, yeah. that's or the way you, oh, you made your Christmas decorations or whatever it yeah. is. Yeah. And you see, and I assure you, if you ask that person, are you an artist? They would say, no, I don't know anything about art. I don't understand art. Right. But yet they can take that boulder and place it perfectly in a way which looks, you know, beautiful. Yeah. They do it in a fashion that doesn't hurt the stone. And, you know, right. they do everything that an artist would do. And they probably dream about it as well. Yet, you know, it's the thing. What, what is art? What is creative? I mean, people have asked me, am I an artist? And I usually say, well, I don't really consider myself an artist, though I write and I do photography and different things. But in my own mindset, I feel more like I'm an art connoisseur and an art dealer. And that's, you know, that's what's on my, I, I guess what... On your kind of what you're talking about, what your expertise is or what you make yes. money. With. So, yeah, you know, and I mean, I know I've had I mean, when I used to teach workshops, I would have some very famous artists who uh, made way more money than we did. And some of them would say, well, I'm not really an artist because I just do commissions for people and do them the way they wanted it. And so it's like they didn't even even though they made money at art, they kind of pushed back at this idea of art, too. And so the economics of things kind of muddy the whole waters of what art is and trying to define it and come up with right. definitions is just so fraught. And, and I always am 
always and, and difficult to to you know uh to put labels on things like that even like plein air you know when planet the plein air thing started people would ask me kevin mcpherson had invited me years ago to do the plein air painters of america and i did that for like nine years and with all of our friends matt smith and all these great artists and i learned so much from them and his was the first plein air show and then it spread everywhere but then after a certain point it started to become so popular and they were all over the country and it was a weird thing because collectors would start asking uh, and even other artists would challenge and challenge and say, well, now, Scott, do you call yourself a plein air artist, plein air painter? And I'd say, well, no, I don't, I don't call myself anything. And they'll say, well, that's good because, you know, you're not you, you can't call yourself a plein air painter if you do anything from photographs or even if you do any plein air paintings that you do in more than one session and touch it up later. And I was like, OK, that's that's why I don't want to give any labels to things, because these labels get so crazy, you know, and uh, so. I think it's best to just let other people decide what's yeah. really art and what's not. And, you know, uh, what's, what's, you know, what, whatever it's, it's, it's really, I, I find that once you give any kind of label, you're going to get a ton of people who are going to like be challenging. you. <laughs> it's so funny. But, and I, it sounds like in <clears throat> your own mind or how, what I hear is that, you know, I don't think you could give either up you know they're both have equal weight they're just different and it's how you see the world at that moment what you're going to do is that would that be a true statement well i don't gosh it's like i've thought about that many times because there's been times where i got into something else writing a story or doing a documentary that i've i have not painted for like five or six months because yeah. i just got into that project and i worked right. on it um so i mean i i I don't follow the money. So um, those other things didn't make much money, you know, um, but it was really cool when a few of them became very well known and popular and, and so many people saw them, uh, you know, even even like even like my novels, you know, I could probably do a couple big paintings and make more money than than all of the novels together. Right. Uh, took me, that. <laughs> you know, the amount of time that it spent right. me, it doesn't matter. Uh, no, no. Even, if, even if they don't sell any, I, I am excited to have written them. And so honestly, if I got excited about something, I probably would be just as happy if that was what was really just driving me and obsessing me. And I felt like that's what I wanted to say. And the best medium was film or writing or whatever, right. or painting. If I gave up painting or, or, whatever the other thing was, as long as I had something else creative uh, that was taking my energy up, I think I'd be fine with giving up something uh, yes. to concentrate on something else. So, cause I don't see them. I don't see them that differently. I, I know that I'd have to be doing something creative that I felt I was learning from and that I was expressing some important thing that I want to express, um, you know, to, to other people. Cause it's really a communication, you know, writing right. and painting and, so I think as long as I was doing that, I, I, I wouldn't care if I was painting or whatever, writing or whatever. Yeah. That tells me that your ego is not tied up into who you are as a person. That's why you say, I don't know if I'd call myself an artist or whatever. You could easily transition from one to the other because it's what drives you creatively, not from an ego base. This is who I am. This is who I am. It's hard for a lot of people, I think, to do that. Um creative people that can do multiple things because they do have this is who I am in their head and to do the other is difficult and you'll see it occasionally like Tom Ford a great designer but also a great movie director right or Julian Schnabel who's a one of a, does beautiful movies and also is known as a painter or even you know Paul McCartney who paints and beautiful paintings but you know he can't it would be hard for him to break out of being an artist a, a musician but i bet he would like it at times to be able to just say you know i don't care so you know and sometimes you get st stuck into that i'm glad we're actually having this podcast because it allows people to see the other side of you not just as a you know painter but uh, as a broad-based artist and film and and books and things which i didn't know about and you and i had you know sat down and had a nice talk in uh Buller rock and you know i didn't know you were a writer and you didn't know i was a writer so it's well yeah yeah well yeah it's, it is interesting and i don't necessarily feel like i i have to uh 
overlap them or whatever. I think that you choose a medium because it has something you want to say. I, people will often say, well, we've read some of your books uh, and God, some of these ideas, like the, my first novel is used in, I've gotten written from several teachers who teach uh, philosophy in, in regular colleges. And they say they use that their first year because it, it's all about, a lot of it's about philosophy and different philosophy kind of embodied by different characters. And they had no idea they were they had no idea that I did painting at all yeah. and a lot of people who write me for the stories in fact when we were at the portrait society this last year uh there's a I'm forgetting his last name now he's a great artist named Sean and he was one of the finalists in the portrait society and he's from Australia and he had given up he had given up being an evolutionary biologist he worked professionally that was his field he gave that up to go into painting and he always doing these incredible paintings but it was so funny when I met him, he came up to me at the porch site. He goes, oh, well, you know, there's a um, there's a, uh, uh, a documentary filmmaker who's made films, you know, on on, uh, you know, all, all these different interesting subjects that, in you know, interviewed all these scientists and all these different people um, that uh, is quite popular among all of my friends who are scientists and evolutionary biologists and physicists and all this stuff. And he's, he has your same name. He's named Scott Burdick also. And I said, oh, that's actually me. I made those documentaries because uh, I was interested. So I interviewed all those people and did that. And he was like, wait a minute. No, do you mean this? And he said the names of them. I said, yeah, no, those, those are mine. I never show myself in the, my documentaries. I just interview people. I just show the people I'm interviewing. Yes. Uh, but uh, he's like, wait a minute. But but that you, you were interviewed Richard Dawkins and, you know, uh, all of these famous people, you know, and I was like, oh, yeah. He goes, how did you do that? He's like, well, they had read my book and they had asked me, you know, if I'm in town. Get... So he was like, oh, my God, that's crazy. You know, and so it's so interesting. He's like, well, in nobody knows you're a painter. <laughs> so it was kind of funny. And I was like, well, I, I bet most painters don't know that I make documentaries or I do stories either. So it's kind of just it doesn't matter to me that they don't overlap. And probably people in some of those different things aren't interested in in what I write, because what I write. I write it because it's something I can't paint. Right. I can't do, I see painting as a visual language. And so I'm going for a visual story, a visual emotion that I, I mean, if I were to describe a painting that I love, a Maynard Dixon painting, for example, that, or, or a Blumenschein, some of the Blumensteins are just some of my favorite paintings ever that have so much emotion from having first seen. If I were to try to describe that in words Art. to someone who hadn't seen it, I yeah. mean, Forget about a thousand words. I could write a whole novel and you would never get that emotional impact that you get from seeing one of those paintings mm. uh, in just a split second. Right. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, the the intricacy of things that I like to write about, artificial intelligence and morality and all these religion and all these things that I write about in these books, no painting could ever be more than like a cartoon of the simple, fly, simplified version of what I write about. And so therefore I don't tend to, um, you know, overlap them. Mm. What is the, what are the documentaries that you're talking about? So can people find them, their names? And sure, would... you can find them just on YouTube. Uh, one is called In God We Trust with a question mark. That was the first one that that became a huge thing because it was a, a it was a, a political, it was about separation of church and state and it dealt with something that happened in my town. Um, and it actually led to a court case in federal court uh, that set a precedent and all this stuff with uh, overlapping separation of church and state. And then the other one is called um, In Reason We Trust. And that was Richard Dawkins and Eddie Izzard and a lot of the, uh, the uh, a lot of the scientists asked me if I would film this rally in Washington, D.C. that 30,000 people came to. And so they asked if I'd come and film it. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm just me with a camera. And, and they said, oh, we'll get a couple camera people for you and stuff too. But we really want you to do the interviews of all of the speakers and, yeah. and some of the people there. So that that I went for. And it was just a day of filming. And then I edited it together. Um, and then another one was, uh, then I made a couple other small ones. But uh, those are the main ones. So, yeah. 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 They were fun to do. They were interesting to me. I learned a lot from talking to people yeah. on both sides of all those issues. Oh, so each good. What I like to do is I like to interview people and I never do a narration. I never like say, but like I said, people's biases are going to show no matter what. But I really try to show like the one on separation of church and state was such an education for me. So I went around to like 
uh, the Jefferson Memorial. I went to Washington, D.C. I went to Monticello. I interviewed historians on separation church state, where it came from. I interviewed uh, uh, the head of the theology uh, department at uh, Wake Forest. I, I went all over. I interviewed all these people. But then for the actual issue, I interviewed all the different people on both sides of this issue who are kind of battling each other over this idea of, of you know, whether we whether the country should be a uh, taxes should go to support a particular religion or if it should be like the First Amendment, you know, implies that it shouldn't be. So, and I learned so much and it was so, in fact, the James Dunn, who is the uh, head of the theology, he passed away a couple of years ago. He became, after interviewing, he became one of my best friends. We would have uh, lunch together. He, he had known five presidents. He had been there when uh, Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act in 1965. And he was just a wonderful person. In fact, he asked me to come to D.C. Uh, he taught a class on separation of church and state for the um, Divinity School at Wake Forest. And he asked me uh, a few years before he died if I would come on the bus because he would take his class every year to D.C. Uh, and go to the White House. And he had some of his students uh, worked there in the different administrations. Mm -hmm. And then they would give a talk. And so he said, could you show your film on the bus? And we'll have a discussion with the, with the students. And then we went there. Uh, I spoke and Kathleen Kennedy and several other civil rights people there spoke about it. Some some were religious, some were not. And it was very interesting. So I, I learned so mm -hmm. much from those things. And all those experiences are just because I was interested in them, you know, and I just had a camera. So I would just go out now and then and interview people on this over a year and uh, travel here, travel there and uh you know, it was uh, just kind of in my spare time, but it was it was fascinating. That had to be an unusual feeling when you're with such high powered, important, you know, people that are changing the world, including the Kennedys and this individual. And then you're up <laughs> on this, doing it, you know, your speech and they're showing your movie. Well, I mean, what's that? What's that feel like when you're doing that? Are you in the well, moment? And absorbing I, as being in I mean, the to me, it's more about the actual things that are said. So when I do a documentary, it's not me speaking, really. All I do is interview people. So I, I'm completely Socratic method. So I ask people questions, okay? And I ask them questions on both sides of these issues. Um, and some people get tripped up because they haven't, you know, quite considered some of these things. And people do get angry at me later on, you know? And it's fascinating. I got so many uh angry messages from people because they said uh you know when i said this i you know i didn't mean that now yeah or, or i'm angry i want you to take that out of the film i want you to take this out of the film and i would have, it was funny too because i have of course everybody sign uh sign um, yeah you know forms that they they have to uh and you know so they can't go back but uh you know, but I'll, I usually will ask them, well, would you change what you said in the film now? You know, um, I don't want to get it wrong. And they always will say, well, no, that's what I believe. But I just think I don't want it in the film. And I'm like, well, I can. I mean, that's the whole point is. Uh, and then we ha I had one great okay. comfort. He's a very famous um, fundamentalist uh, preacher. And he uh, I interviewed him at the Reason Rally. And he was an interesting guy. And he uh, he uh, he then claimed when I was going to put out the film, I had him and Lawrence Krauss, who's a famous physicist, speak. Because Lawrence actually said, well, Ray Comfort, you interviewed him, and he wanted to talk to me, but I don't want to do it because I'm afraid he'll mis-edit, misquote me. But if you film it and put out it in full, I'll do it. So I said, all right. So I interviewed them together, Penn, Gillette, all these famous people were right. came to watch me interview him in, 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 their, in their thing. And it was fascinating, but it was so funny, too, because like a couple of days after... Afterwards, uh, uh, Ray Comfort's people called me and they, and they said, oh, well, you know, we don't want you releasing this. You don't have our permission to release it. And I said, well, he signed a uh, release form, you know, and they said, well, he says that he didn't, you know, he didn't sign it. And uh, and I had this happen before for a different film too. this exact same thing a couple of times. And 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 I and I said and he said, well, you know, what? if if we take you to court, people aren't going to believe you, you know, and uh, and and I said, well. Uh, the thing is, is whenever I interview somebody, I turn my camera on and I have them sign the release form then. And so I, I sent them the video of Ray looking at the release form, making jokes about it, commenting on it and signing it. And then they just stopped. But it was uh, interesting how often that has happened, you know, and uh, 
and I and I and I have gotten you know especially the King the first film uh, about separation of church and state I did get a lot of threats uh, death threats and things like that and Susan and I for a little while thought we were going to move um, but uh, the it, it settled down eventually and the nicest thing was so many people in the town came up to me and said privately seeing the film changed my view. Of, of it you know uh it completely changed my view i can't say it publicly because i'll get people will boycott my business or whatever but it really did and so that that made me feel really good and um i i remember around that time somebody had asked me at one of the conferences i think american artist conference uh that we used to have that weekend with the masters and and somebody had asked one of these uh i was on the panel with george gallo and some other people and they said um uh, are you afraid that people will stop buying your paintings because you're so open and you tackled these controversial subjects in your novels and in your, right. in your, in your uh, things. And really the way I, the answer I gave is the way I still feel about it is it's like, and it, cause, cause I, even, even at this Willow Rock show, one of the artists came up to me and said, I'm so happy that you say what you do in some of your, your essays and films. I feel that way, but I'm afraid to say, because I'm afraid that collectors might, be offended and not buy my work. And so every single show that happens to me, it's fascinating. All the artists who, who say that and just people. Um, so I, personally, and I don't think everybody has to do this, but for me personally, I feel like if you're afraid, too afraid to say what you really think or to explore an idea that's controversial, you know, I don't think you should probably be, you know, at, at least a filmmaker or a writer, these sorts of things. I mean, you know, I mean, I think that you should, people should be brave. And I mean, I have friends that I completely disagree with on their viewpoints on religion and politics and everything. And we have wonderful discussions and we're, we've been friends forever. Matt and I, it's funny, everybody says, oh, we love when you and Matt Smith talk, you know, and have these long discussions when we go on these pack trips. We just love it because you're best friends. You disagree with a lot of things, but you know, you're just, you, you know, you're respectful. And, uh, in fact, I got some messages, uh, many times from people in Pakistan and, and countries like that in Iraq and, and, uh, and, and especially in, uh, in Iran, uh, who say they, they actually sign on like secretly through secret ways uh, to go on to Facebook and stuff and read. And I'll, sometimes I, I haven't done it in a while, but these long discussions about topics. And sometimes it's religion. We all talk about our different viewpoints and make our points. And these artists they're all artists who read read those from these countries they say it is amazing to watch these discussions that you have that go through hundreds of posts you know and you're all posting things that support your your thoughts and your things and then they'll say uh and they say and then you get to the end of it and they, and if anybody's rude i'll give them a warning if not i i have to ban them which happens rarely it's mm -hmm. surprising how rare that is and um and they say, and then you get to the end of it, and they're like, "Oh, and love the new painting you did. I can't, I can't wait for us to paint together at this show or that show." Right. They're just like, "This just blows our mind," because we live in a country where it's actually illegal for us to say those things that you say against whatever you know. For them, it's it's Islam, and uh, they're like, "And the fact that you guys say this and have a discussion and disagree, and then you're friends to to them, it doesn't even matter." They most of them don't agree with 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 my view. They're they're Islamic or whatever they are, whatever whichever religion they are. But they're just the actual fact of being able to openly discuss things. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I feel like when people say, you know, are you afraid that you? And I've had artists say this to me. You know, you're you you are you you're gonna people are gonna stop collecting your work, you know, because you're you know. And I'm like, well, you know, it's I, I mean, we have such. And if you think through history, uh, we were just in Rome. And, and somebody had said to me, uh, well, you know, all of these artists, these great artists of the past, we're all, we're all, you know, Catholic, you know, we're all Christian, we're all this and that. And I'm like, well, and we were, in, we were, we had just been in one of the plazas where they had uh, Gianardo uh, Bruno, who had been put to death for questioning, you know, um, uh, God. And I'm like, how would you know? I mean, look at people are put to death back then. How would you know what they believed? Right. You could only actually have a free discussion and know what somebody actually believes. I mean, the church was the only one buying things there, employing people. Anybody who would say it was not only committing artistic suicide. So, I mean, to me, we, when we travel and stuff, it's so clear to me because we go to a lot of those sorts of countries. 
And we're like, wow, what a gift we have to be able to actually say what we think, yeah. you know, and it's just what we think. And I've changed my mind multiple times on lots of these issues. So I'm, I know I may change my mind again, but it, it distresses me that so many people go into their little bubbles and they'll only talk to people who agree with them. And I think that's one of the, the greatest dangers, you know, of losing that, you know, that artistic freedom of being able to say what you actually think and actually talk about something or paint something or make a movie about something, you know, that you really care about that really matters that might actually change someone's mind. And that, to me, all the messages, all the emails that I get from my novels and from Banishment of Beauty was that was a was a talk that I gave one time on art and, you know, uh, beauty. Uh, and all these messages I get from people who say, I read this and it gave me a different way of looking at things or changed my mind or it spoke to me because it said something that I want to say that I've never been able to put into words. Right. To me, that's what being a successful artist, writer, filmmaker is, is that, that connection actually. I mean, so if if you're just talking to, giving speeches to people who all already agree to you, with you, I, I'm not sure that that's really adding anything to society or to, you know, history, so... Sorry, I, yeah. that there's my long-winded lecture. <laughs> no, but I get it. I mean, that's I mean, art of any type should be about emotion. It should be mm -hmm. about communication. And you know, as you know, as an art dealer, when I'm looking at an artist for uh, representation, the number one thing is, do they have an original voice, whatever that may be, right? Do right. they have something to add to the dialogue that's theirs? And, you know, obviously everything's built upon history and other artists. That's the way it is, unless you're Pollock. But, the, and, and even he was built on sand paintings from the Navajos. So, you know, I think it is important to have this original voice and not to be afraid to do the things that were given to you, um, you know, as a creative person. And so clearly you do that and you don't worry about it. But you kind of do that anyway in just the way you handle, I think, your art profession, you know, you're not as reliant, I think, on, you know, other dealers selling your work, people come to you, you get commissions, you do shows. You well, know. Actually, I don't, I don't do commissions, but uh, I just send paintings out and uh, I, I don't sell many paintings myself. We maybe we will someday now that they've yeah. internet, something, but uh, yeah, I, I, one of the reasons we moved to North Carolina was so I wouldn't have to do commissions, do portrait commissions or anything. I'll do <laughs> Every now and then, you know, of yeah. somebody uh, that's a friend. Right. Um, uh, but I really want to be able to just paint what I want to paint. Yeah. Uh, without, and, and it gets stresses me out. So we moved to North Carolina, you know, 28 years ago. So that I'm from Chicago so that we wouldn't have the overhead. So we bought our house. We paid it off in five years. And then after that, we just were like, we only buy everything with cash. So we won't buy a car or anything new. And we will. And now we've got plenty of money saved. But um, so we could move, move back to Chicago or New York or whatever. But uh, at the time, that really freed us up because I was always having to get the rent every month. And we were always struggling in Chicago. You know, the apartment was so expensive. Our, mm -hmm. our mortgage in North Carolina for our house, uh, a big house, was half what our, what our rent was in Chicago. And so uh, once we had that pressure off, I stopped taking commissions. I just painted what I wanted. And then we tried to find places that would sell what we wanted. And at that time, it was mostly Western art. And I wasn't really doing much Western art. But Western art was still realistic. And so galleries out West, where we went, uh, partly because Richard Schmidt had a, a gallery in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. So we started selling things there. But mm -hmm. then Taos and Breckenridge and other places that we would sell things, Scottsdale, um, even though I wasn't really doing Western work at the time, it was realistic. And so in Chicago, it was all just modern uh, stuff, abstract and really modern things and same in New York. So uh, so that was kind of how I that's kind of how I still look at it is because I'm, I'm doing different things now that don't fit with a lot of the galleries that I'm with right now. So I just do things and then I find where they'll fit, where they'll sell. So yeah. I'll find a different gallery that will sell that kind of work or whatever so um we had this discussion actually i remember it very well at lunch oh, interaction yeah. was that you know because you do paint all these you know whether it's china or africa or wherever you go 
And I said, does that make it hard for you to sell your artwork? And you said, well, I don't really care because mm-hmm. I just make what I'm and what create what moves me and it finds a home. Yeah, some do and some don't. And they surprise you. Sometimes things that I mean, Sue, especially so I'll do, so there's lots of paintings I do. And Sue's like, don't send that there. I don't want to see your disappointment. <laughs> it doesn't sell. And then that'll be the most popular one. Right. You know, and that's something that we think is really sellable, but I haven't painted for that reason, will not sell. And right. so, uh, you know, the, the thing about it is, uh, that's also why, you know, we did a couple prints when we were in Chicago, and then, then I didn't want to do them because then the print company wanted to tell you, well, you got to do something that's more universally, uh, you know, likable. And I, was, I realized, right, right, that for that, you've got to do something that has a large, uh, you know, market. But for original paintings... You just need one person. And right. so often just that right person. And I all feel like every painting has somebody who's going to have that same reaction that I had to the subject. It's just a matter of finding them. Sometimes it takes a couple of years before the right person sees it, you know. Right. And uh, uh, so it's easier, I think, doing original paintings, you know, um, that way. Uh, so but I, I do see that if if I... You know, like Morgan Weisling, he he had contacted me when he was an illustrator and sent me out of the blue. I'd never met him pictures uh, of his. He'd done some samples to try to get into gallery work, try to get out of illustration. Right. And, and I said, wow, these are incredible. This person's a great artist. I didn't know he was a movie artist, uh, poster artist, and he did really well. And so I called him and said, oh, I love your work. And he uh, and so he was asking me advice. And he said, well, but, you know, some people have told me that. I won't be considered a serious artist like you if I if I'm doing seeing subjects that are kind of seen as too saccharine or too Norman Rockwellish and things like that. And I told him, well, you know, I mean, uh, what do you think? I mean, are you doing this because you are see a market and you see this niche and this is what the galleries are telling you? And he said, no, 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 no. this is this <laughs> is what I've always wanted to paint. You know, I. I love my, his, his favorite thing was Little House on the pr- pr- Prairie growing up. Right. I would still watch these things because that's just right. what I love. And I, as much as I try to do some serious painting, <laughs> just not what I want to paint. And right. so I said, well, forget it. Who cares? You know, I mean, I said, you are going to be extremely successful with yeah, this. You, I, you and I were at, were at the time I was at, uh, Dan Gerhardt and I were, were represented in Scottsdale um, by uh, the same gallery he was going to go with. He, he was looking to go with, and I gave him some advice on, on how that, I said, but no, you're going to, I said, your, your, your shows are going to be much more successful. It mm-hmm. says, but um, you don't worry about what people think of this as far as being um, profound or art or whatever. It's the same thing. It's why I did that banishment of beauty, uh, you know, video we put on YouTube. You know, I think beauty itself is worthwhile. I don't think everything, like a lot of my documentaries, people will see some of my documentaries are like, well, well but you, your paintings seem kind of shallow compared to these issues. It's like, no, beauty is is not shallow, right. you know, and it, it's inspiring if it inspires people. So, I mean, who knows what people are going to see as important later. But uh, so with like with Morgan, I was like, forget it. You don't don't do things because galleries tell you to do them because they're important or they'll sell, but yeah. also don't do things just because people like them. I mean, bringing joy is a great thing, you know? And uh, and I said, you know, you no, don't let anybody tell you what to paint. And I really do believe that. And I really do uh, do practice that. Susan and I both, yeah. yeah. Not only joy to the person who's looking at it and purchasing it, but also to yourself. Right. You know? It's yeah, really I mean, that's the, to me, that's the, that's the test. If you do, if you do something because you want to sell it, whether it's a novel or whatever, you're, you're right. a, a documentary, a movie, you think I'm doing this. I don't really like this. You yeah, know, you've lost. Movie. You're out already. I, but 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 <laughs> I'm doing this just to make money. I've heard people say this. I'm going to do this because I can make money, enough money then to have 10 years to do my own work. Okay. So uh-huh. if you do that right. and then don't sell it, you feel like, God, I wasted my time. What yeah. a waste of time to have done that. All right. If you do it because you like, you want to do it, you love to do it, right. and nobody reads your novel, nobody buys your painting, you're still going to be happy you did it. It's like yeah. going to school, you know. All the people I know who went and, and followed their dream to become a, you know, a famous musician or a dancer or whatever it is, that's always the highlight of their memories of their life. They're not sorry that they did that. It's only the people who 
followed th their parents told them you've got to be a lawyer right. you know and people want to be lawyers they love it they do it they're you know that, that's right. their passion if they don't want to do it and then they end up i know all these people go to that and then they they, they go into a year and they're like i'm not doing this they feel like they wasted their time that year so they did actually <laughs> painting you know i mean don't just do them so Every time I don't sell something, I might be, feel sad. Oh, well, nobody really liked it as much as me, but I don't feel like God, I, that's a, that means I shouldn't paint things like that, right. you know, or I'm sorry that I painted that one or took that trip, you know, so. So, yeah. let's, so let's go to the beginning, if you don't mind. We've do, we've had a wonderful talk already. It was a podcast. Yeah. So yeah. But there's so much to know about you as a person, because to get where we are having this discussion now of your beliefs and what you do and everything that came from your background growing up as well mm -hmm. to some extent you know we oh, are yeah. we, we are what you know we're uh, exposed to both family and environment and mm -hmm. all the rest so where did you grow up i grew up in chicago it's called unwood park it's like right on the border of northwest uh chicago it's a it's a uh i guess it would be a suburb but it's um it's a immigrant neighborhood called unwood park uh, when I was there, it was mostly um, all Italian. It was a largest concentration of Italian um, American immigrants. My grandmother was from Italy, and uh, and so I grew up there. Uh, is a, a a kind of a working class neighborhood, not a lot of money or anything. I didn't know anybody who did things like I did, um, but I was born. Uh, and my parents got that they, their passion is wanting to raise kids. They got married right out of high school, and that was their goal. And they had kids, and I was the oldest, uh, and. Uh, um, they, I was born though with uh, severe club feet. So both my feet were turned nearly around. Mm -hmm. And so had I been born 10 years before, I would have been crippled my whole life. I probably mm -hmm. wouldn't have walked. Like I see people in India and other countries that we go to had just what I had. And they, they're just on a skateboard moving around. You know, it's really, uh, I'm very fortunate. And, um, uh, I was lucky enough. My dad had a, a, a low paying job at a drugstore, but, um, the insurance when I was born told them that even though they had insurance for pregnancy, they said it didn't cover uh, club feet because that was a pre-existing condition. So I'm, you know, so they said you they're not going to pay. So I wouldn't have got operations even then, except for there was a doctor named Dr. Tashton, um, who was a famous doctor and had 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 been doing groundbreaking things on how to correct club feet in children over over years, many years. And so he said he would waive his fee. And there were still a lot of fees that put my parents quite in debt. Um, but I, over many years and many operations growing up, I um, it was corrected and I could walk. I still have problems with my feet and I, I'm always getting stress fractures. And it's uh, it's um, it's always it's always a difficulty. I have to be very careful. But it's um, uh, but yeah, I can walk and I can hike and I can do things. Uh, and uh, so I grew up a lot in hospitals, and I probably have some of that to thank for, uh, you know, I dr would draw. My mother would bring me books about how to draw things out of simple shapes and make them into things. And I was always reading from a very young age. And, of course, even in school, I was on crutches for a lot of the time, so I wasn't in sports. And, you know, and then when I was off it, I could go out and play with friends in the neighborhood. But uh, I, I think I, I did kind of turn me inward. Uh, quite a bit but that might be just my my natural personality too but i i i read a lot of books and i um i was probably overly serious you know as my brothers and sisters said you know i think and uh i uh we were it was a catholic neighborhood everybody i knew was catholic i went to the same catholic grade school uh uh that my my mother went to with the nuns and there was a, there was about half nuns left when we went there when I went there and then I went to the same high school just a block away that my uncles had all gone to Holy Cross with the Jesuits and uh, I try to make this as fast as possible uh, and I was a readaholic and I halfway through high school I, I read the whole Bible I read the Quran I read the book of the Gita I read the history of religion I, like I said I I just read a lot right. and uh, and I really read Thomas Aquinas not the full Thomas Aquinas uh uh, some of the theological, but the, the 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 basic points of it and stuff, and and I basically lost my belief in in religion, all mm -hmm. religions, uh, while I was in Catholic uh, school. You know, school, uh, our poor <laughs> neighborhood school, and uh, in fact, it was funny because 
uh, when I first met Bill Anton, I assumed he is from out West, you know, and he was oh, like, God. he was like, he's like, oh, wait, you're, you, you grew up in Chicago too. Where? And I, and I said, oh, I went to Holy Cross. And he's like, oh, I grew up in Oak Park where Sue grew up. My wife grew up just uh, uh, next door to Elmwood Park. It was more of a middle-class neighborhood. And I was like, no way. And he was like, he was like, I went to Fenwick. It was the, it was the wealthy Catholic school. Right. And ours was the poor Catholic school. They had pools and they were ties. And I was like, right. I can't believe it. But Anyway, so I, I lost my my belief while I was in school there. And of course, every single person I knew was Catholic and everybody yeah. was convinced that Including all but all your parents and your siblings and your relatives, too, right? Relatives, friends, everybody. Yeah. And it was all around the church. And so I didn't say anything. I just I did stop going to church except for like Easter or Christmas or whatever, but uh, which was upsetting. But I think they just figured I'd grow out of it. And I never told anybody. In fact, that's kind of an interesting story. I don't know if, th if this is the right subject for your podcast, but uh, all the subjects are right. Okay. Well, uh, and and I can tell this story now, actually, because well, the painting behind this in involves Richard Schmidt. So I didn't tell anybody, and I just really didn't think anything of it because I never had any bad experiences with the church. It wasn't based on not liking the priests or anything. I liked everybody there. I liked the brothers uh, that taught at my school the Jesuit brothers and everything, I just didn't believe it. I just thought if I'd been raised in India, I'd believe what they told me, you know? And so um, I uh, so I just concentrated on art and reading and all this stuff. And I went to the academy and uh, then Richard Schmidt moved back to Chicago uh, for his daughter Gretchen to go there because he had gone there like 30 years before us, the American Academy of Art. Uh, was, and he grew up in Chicago in a German Catholic neighborhood. Um, and uh, was I knew he would, had been very religious because he, uh, or he was, uh, because he, when he finished the academy, he actually joined, went to a monastery for three months to try it out because he, he was doing murals and things even while, while he was in school for the Catholic church and stuff in his neighborhood. And in fact, he asked me to go and take photographs of them and they, it had subsequently burned down. So those photographs are the only ones that he had. Um, and so one time, but I never talked about religion with any of my friends, and, and I didn't really even talk that much about things, uh, just art uh, with Nancy Guzik and all of our friends, Rose Franson and Dan Gerhardt. And uh, one time we were out in, in Door County, Wisconsin, and it was the first time I ever painted landscapes. Um, and Richard, we all went out there and stayed with a friend, and we painted for a week landscapes there. Albert Handel was there. And Nancy Guzik, or was Franson, Dan Gearhart, and several other friends. Um, and uh, Richard would always often bring up these philosophical discussions uh, at the palette chisel after painting and all kinds of things. And, and they were interesting. And honestly, I didn't add that much a lot of times. I just at that time I just would listen. You know, I like hearing people's thoughts, but I I was was not in the habit of of contributing too much. And uh, Richard asked this question. Uh, He's, we we're all sitting around after a day of painting, and he said, so what do you all think? It does God, is there a God or is there not a God? Um, what, do you, what is your thought? What is your belief? And I was just like, oh, I don't want to say that I don't believe in God. You right. know, and I was the last one. I was going to go around the the thing. Albert Handel was much more new age, but everybody else was, was basically uh, Christian. Uh, either Catholic or with, with various forms of Christianity. So they went around one after the other, everybody saying, yes, they believe in God and, and why it was so important to them. And it came to me. And I was like, you know, and I knew Richard had gone to the monastery and done all this stuff. And so I, I just didn't want to say, so I just gave the kind of agnostic answer. I said, well, I don't, I don't think you can really know whether there's a God. It's beyond our, it's beyond our knowledge. You know I mean? I just have very limited experience, you mean? And uh, so Richard said, okay, I, he goes, I, I, I can see that. That's good. He said, but Scott, I am not going to let you get away with not answering once again <laughs> these discussions. I want you to tell me now, if what would be your guess? Is there a God or isn't there a God? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I really, I just don't like to lie just in general. I just, I'll not say anything, but I, I don't want to talk with somebody, but um, he put me on the spot. So finally, I said, my guess would be that there is no God of any kind, you know, and I get give like maybe a, a quick 
summary of, well, I mean, the Greeks, they put Socrates to, you know, to death for you know, denying uh, that the Greek gods exist and all this sort of stuff and all, all these different reasons why I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think it was true, but I could be wrong. I just didn't, that would be my guess. And there was like shocked okay. silence. And I think, I think it was Rose. It, it could have been Rose or Nancy, but they said, but Scott, how could you, you're such a good person. How could you not believe in God? I mean, you do all this volunteering and refugee camps and all you take spring breaks and volunteer and build these things. I mean, how could you not believe in God? And uh, which, you know, doesn't mean you can't be a good person. But, uh, but I, so I was just like, oh, you know, that's just, that's just what I believe. Maybe I'll change my mind, you know, but they were really shocked by it. And then Richard said, he said, hmm, well, that's that's what I think too. And he just brought up another just another topic. He didn't say anything else but that. And I was like, what? You know, I was like, and so it was the first person I had met who said that they didn't believe in God. And I, he was the last person I thought was going to say it. And um, and it's interesting. I uh, we had uh, many discussions then afterwards. Whenever even even up to a few months before his death, whenever I came over, he wanted to talk about science. We never we rarely talked about art. He wanted to talk about science. He wanted me to explain how can the universe expand faster than the speed of light, all these sorts of things. He loved that. And then we would talk about philosophy and religion. And he uh, he said, uh, and I he said, you know, you can tell people what I think after I die, but I don't want to say it now for that reason that I don't want people, you know, getting mad at me. And, you know, because he'd written a couple political things against like invading Iraq and he got all this angry messages. And so he said, I'm, he goes, I'm just, I don't have the, uh, I don't have the uh, patience for that, you know? And so I'm not going to, I'm just, you know, he goes, I love reading all the stuff you write. And whenever I would write an essay or put it on, he would always call and he'd just be like, we talked about this for like two hours around the dinner table, you know, and everything. And I'm just so excited that you're saying these things and, you know, and, and uh, so it was interesting, but that was kind of an interesting moment for me because I was the first person that I, I mean, I'm sure I knew people who were, who didn't believe. And of course now, because I've written some essays on it and been open about it, mm-hmm. every single show, I have so many people come up to me uh, and say, I'm so happy that you're open about it because I know that you get a lot of angry messages uh, about that, but, you know, I can't say anything to my family or to my um, some of the people actually start have, have started to cry at the pre to west and other places when they'll tell me well it was a docent there that, that did um just how it meant so much to have somebody who was well known you know be open about about their thoughts on that because they feel like they're going to be judged so much or their family might cut them off or whatever and you well, know so, you know in certain well, environments absolutely yeah, sure. absolutely. yeah I, I interviewed a few people in some of my films that that exact thing happened to them yeah a, a lot some of them that were because they were gay some because they they had a different belief in the religion and yeah no it's an absolute real thing yeah it's a real it's a real danger you know and in fact when i made the film on separation of church and state in king that that really came true to came home to me because nobody who was against what was happening you know they went around to all the businesses what caused me to actually do the documentary was uh, they went around to all the businesses when when there was a when they were demanded when a veteran from Afghanistan came back and said, "Well, I don't feel that the Veterans Memorial should have the Christian flag on it, and you should do services there with with the mayor every year, every thing, because I'm not Christian and I feel like it should be we shouldn't have used four hundred thousand dollars to build this memorial as a Christian monument. There's veterans who are of all th- base, and they told him he would go to go to hell, and then they when there was a threat and they they had to take the flag down because their lawyer said, you know, it's against the thing. And, and, you know, they went around to all the businesses in town and they told them, if you don't put up the Christian flag in your window, we're going to boycott you. Even the the Indian family uh, who ran the subway and stuff. And, uh, and so I spent a year just interviewing as this all unfolded. And then I put out the film just on YouTube. I didn't think anybody would see it, but it turned into this huge thing. I mean, all these famous people shared it in their things, this documentary, filmmaker, you know, film festivals asked for it. I never submitted it to anybody. I never was able to go because we always had something else happening. But um, but the interesting thing is when I put the film out and I got all these threats um, and, and people, the first threats were funny because they said, we're going to boycott you and your family. They're never going to be able to work here or sell anything. Whatever their businesses, it'll be shut down. I was like, well, 
my family all live in Chicago and all I sell all my paintings, you know, to their state. So I, but I realized why nobody in town that was against this extreme thing, there were there were moderate Christians in town who were against it. And they would come up to me privately and say, and I say, oh, can I interview? And they say, well, no, of course I can't be interviewed because right. my whole family. And I realized, wow, I was in a very uh, unique position to be able to actually say something um, that other people couldn't. And uh, it's the same way with uh, with a lot of other things, uh, you know, um, uh, not everybody can, like you said, not everybody can openly say oh. what they believe because yeah, there are real consequences, especially if you have kids or family, one family uh, I, 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 that I had in the film that didn't, wouldn't want to be interviewed, but they told me, you know, they're, they're, their kid was outed as a Catholic, which you, know, you think it's funny, but I mean, Catholics were quite discriminated right. against for a long time. Yeah. Ku Klux Klan was equally against them and blacks and all the Jews. And uh, they actually had to move because their daughters uh, in grade school were being terrorized. Once Once the teacher asked everybody to say what church they went to, and they said, well, we go to a Catholic church in Winston-Salem. And they were just absolutely, oh. you know. Uh, and so it was, uh, it was quite eye-opening to me because I actually didn't, I didn't actually expect it to be that extreme. And like I said, where I grew up, I didn't have to, I, I could have said that I didn't believe. I probably wouldn't have, my, my family, I'm sure, wouldn't have, wouldn't have uh, disowned me or anything. But, uh, you know, I, I didn't have that same threat. Hang I'm sure if I was gay in my neighborhood, I would have had that same feeling because I grew up believing that gay people were in league with the devil. And it wasn't until I went to the American Academy and I met an artist named Bill Kaufman who went to work for Disney and become one of the best artists, greatest artists there in all their films. Uh, he was gay. And uh, when I met him, literally, and he was so kind, you know, I think you could tell my reaction when I was like, because he was open, he was open right. about it. And, uh, and, but he was very kind. He didn't like condemn my reaction or I didn't say anything, but I was like, you yeah. know, probably just my, you know, because I mean, I've been told you know, I didn't believe I didn't believe in the devil anymore, but I still held that 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 view that was just again, that's a birthright of where you grow up. Mm -hmm. And so he was very kind and we talked and and uh, it was like almost instantly within a minute. I was like, boy, that was all nonsense, wasn't it? You know, they're not just these crazy, you know, rapist sorts of people. But I'm sure growing up gay is very similar to some of these people in other countries that are uh theocracies you know or even neighborhoods you know that are kind of you know there, there's real consequences and you know artists uh that's why I like dan gearhart he's one of my best friends and we would talk about this for years and years because he was catholic at the time we were with richard there but then he became born again christian when he married his wife and so he we have completely different views mm -hmm. but we love talking about that stuff and i mean i understand his viewpoint because some people get very offended by Dan because at shows, you know, some of our friends will come up and say, well, you know, Dan's telling me I'm going to hell, but I'm Catholic or I'm this or I'm that, you know, I believe in God. Right. And it's like, you have to understand from his point of view, he really believes this and he cares about you. He yeah, doesn't want belief you to system. Yeah. You know, and, and I mean, and honestly, in some ways it's very loving the fact that if you know somebody's going to be kidnapped and tortured, you know, in a week from now, and you found out about this, and you tell them and they're like, oh, Scott, you're, you know, you're, you're just, you're just a conspiracy. Not, you know, I don't believe you. I mean, you'd keep trying because you really don't want them to be. And so, you know, and, and again, Dan could be right. I could be wrong. And, uh, you know, I, well, I none of us I know and, and won't know for <laughs> during this part of our journey. <laughs> Right. Well, it's like, did you ever see that South Park? Uh, so people sent me that. I hadn't really watched it much, but people sent me that when I had my one of my films come out. They sent me a South Park episode. Did you ever see that where they, there's a nuclear meltdown or something at the right. nuclear power plant there? And everybody dies. Or, yeah, everybody dies in the town. And they're all end up in hell. And they're looking around and they're like, here's the rabbi, here's the priest, right. here's this. And they're like, well, who was right? And someone said, the Mormons. I'm like, oh, well, the Mormons. Why didn't I? That guy came to my house. And because South Park, I guess, was yeah. done by people who are Mormons. Yeah. And so you kind of like that. You better choose the right one, you know. But <laughs> so, anyway, that, so when, how long ago was that movie, In God We Trust? How long ago was that done? 
I'm thinking 2010, maybe. Yeah. I remember that video actually, interestingly enough. Oh, did you see it? Oh, yeah. wow. It was yeah. yeah. So 2010. And so this whole um, feeling and reading and theologically evaluating who you are and what your belief system is, how did that play into you deciding, okay, I'm going to go into the art world. This is what I, or did it? Maybe it didn't. Maybe it was just. Um, I don't know or, if it's like an exact thing. I wanted to, I wanted to go into either when I was in high school. I wanted to go into either art as painting. I loved. I loved. I really hadn't seen much art other than books I read, like N.C. Wyeth, Howard Pyle. Those were my. Those were my. Uh, those were what I considered artists. So that I thought I would love to do that, or I wanted to be a writer or a filmmaker. Those three things are what I wanted to do. Now, the guidance counselors in school, not, now, not my family hadn't gone to college. My parents or anybody had gone to college at that point. And um, I was very, school was very easy for me. Um, and when we took the test, I scored very high. So the guidance counselors said, you, you know, you for math and science, you could go, you could get a scholarship to college. You should, this is what you should do. But I didn't want to do that because I really was so bored in high school that I and I, I just really wanted to do uh, some sort of artistic thing. So it was those three. Art wasn't any more than those three. Um, I actually applied to scholarships for I sent like a story that I wrote um, at, at, you know, for uh, USC to see if I could maybe get a scholarship to film school and other things. And I got scholarships, but they were like half scholarships, which for me was useless. I wasn't going to be able to to take that. I mean, I worked all paper route at a beef stand all through high school, helping to pay for that. And and, and then I took classes at the academy because they had one scholarship. In fact, my mom was just telling me about that the last time I was home, reminding me because she was like, remember, you wanted to drop out of high school? I was like, right, I did. I, I, I had forgotten because my dad took me to the academy because I was interested in art. And uh there was Thomas Blackshear uh, paintings up there. He had gone there like 10 years before I went. And there was a Dan Gerhardt painting. He was he had finished just when I when I actually ended up starting. Um, I saw all these great paintings and I went to the Art Institute and I hated everything there. And so I was like, I want to go here. And I was a I was going to my junior year of high school and I knew I could test out and just get a D GED. Um, it would have been very easy for me. So I was, I told my parents, I want to quit. I want to drop out and go to the uh, art school. And uh, cause I couldn't get anything in film or writing. So I thought well, I can do this, you know? And, uh, and they were like, well, how would you pay for that? You know? And, uh, and I was like, and, they, and my dad, I think they, they told me now, like, well, they were trying to figure some way to keep me from dropping out. And so they said, well, you know, they they do offer, remember Mr. Shapiro said, they offer one full scholarship every year to graduating seniors. Yes. So you're only eligible if you're a graduating senior, if uh, you graduate. So in my junior year, that became my goal. Uh, I still pursued writing and everything. And I would also try to get scholarships for writing or film because I didn't know I was, if I was going to get that one scholarship. In fact, I pretty much figured it was unlikely. But I also then used my money from my other jobs uh, to go to the academy on Saturdays, every Saturday, I would take life drawing class. And then in the summers, both summers, I took uh, life drawing every single day of the week, during the week, like, almost as, as if it was a full time school and uh, to try to win this scholarship. And right. uh, and so they, they had this test and you had to the test was you, you draw something with charcoal. All these students from around the country came and go apply for the test. For it and i ended up winning it and so that's how i got to go to the academy there and I think uh, maybe thomas blackshire won that same um scholarship he might have yeah 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 i think, yeah. Yeah. I think that he might have yeah yes yeah, yeah. I, I know he won i know he won one of them so they yeah. had other ones that, that were the other years too but yeah he probably did win that same one yeah did you think you would win it i i didn't actually think i would win it um uh i i i knew that i wouldn't have won it if I hadn't taken all those classes, mm -hmm. because uh, when we went there and they, the test was just, you had in the morning, you did a three hours, you had to do a charcoal drawing of a still life. And then three hours in the afternoon after lunch, you would do a, a model, a clothed model on the stage. And when I first started taking life drawing, I had no idea what I was doing. Even though I'd done a lot of drawing in my sketchbook, this was completely different. And so had I not put in all that time, 
I, 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 in fact, Mr. Shapiro, he was the, uh, Irving Shapiro was a great watercolorist and he ran the school. He, um, he had asked me uh, when I finished school there, if he could take, because uh, Mr. Parks had saved, he would always save everybody's, he was my life drawing teacher and Thomas Flaxer's teacher as well, Dan Gearhart's, Nancy Guzik, all these people. He was, he was really their main teacher. Um, he, he would save, would save everything we did our first couple weeks of school so that we could look at them later and realize how much we'd improved, you know, when you get depressed as you do. Right. So Mr. Shapiro kept one of my first drawings and then one of the drawings that I did when I finished school, and he would use that when they went on to high school to show people, you know, to kind of promote the school, try to get people to go there. Right. And he said, people are just so inspired by seeing your first drawings versus your later drawings. Cause he said, all the students were like, that guy did, <laughs> did this, like, we're all better than that. You right. know, and so it made him realize it was just work and practice. And so, um, so I, I, but even then I didn't think, I mean, there was, you're doing your own drawing. You don't see, and they had, they would switch the classes too. So they had this, uh, the, the afternoon ones would come in the morning. So you don't get to see everybody's drawings, what they're all doing and everything. So, you know, I, I mean, there were lots of people who did lots of practice before me. So I'm sure it wasn't like, uh, oh, I won like, Going away, it was easy. Right. I'm sure it was close, you know, between a lot of different people. So the difference was, is when I went there, then I got the scholarship, was that I was so appreciative to be there. I uh, mean, there yeah. were lots of artists there. Nancy Guzik was the same way. She grew up in Cicero, just just also a neighborhood next to mine. Uh, it was more of a, a mob-run kind of a neighborhood as well. Uh, 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 just next to mine. And she had been talked in, forced by her parents to go into math for eight, four years, get her degree, which she hated. And then she got out of it. And she eventually then went to the academy, you know, maybe 10 years after me. Um, but both of us were just so happy to be there that we just, we painted and drew every day at class. And then after school, we would go to the Pal and Chisel and paint every day there and on the weekend. And uh, we just, that's all we wanted to do. And so other students, I don't think had such a, drive. you know, passion, this drive, you know, I mean, it, it, it was their parents paid for it or some, there were some students who went there because they liked art, but they actually weren't good enough to get into this school or they weren't sure they wanted to go to regular college. And so there were some people and there was people there who were uh, much better than I was, um, you know, especially in their second and third year. Um, and they thought we were all crazy to go to the, uh, you know, go to the pallet chisel every night, not go to any parties, not do anything. And, and so it was really just pretty much kind of working harder than everybody else. Yeah. Well, you probably recognize that was your only way out to some extent, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, again, that's, that's what, you know, when you don't have something to fall back on, you know, it's like, I wasn't really worried too much about what I would do after school, I was really just thinking in the moment of just, you know, work, work hard, get good, you know, and uh, right. figure out that later, you know, I figured I would go into illustration. Um, and uh, in fact, I, I entered the Society of Illustrators, both Nancy Guzik and I did um, before Richard moved back to Chicago. And um, uh, we both won, I think, I think second and third place in this student competition. And I went to New York uh, to get the award, it was like fifteen hundred dollars, and uh, I used some of that money to go there to try to see if I could get a job somewhere. Mm -hmm. And all of the art directors said, "You know, uh, we'll hire you, but if I were you, I'd go into fine art because they said all the type of work you're doing here, all your samples, all the stuff, you know, uh, it doesn't exist anymore. It's going away. You know, it's uh, they they don't do this major illustration like Howard Pyle and NCYF right. and line decker and all that anymore they said but you can do this and all of them said that's what they would do if they were back in school they would go into fine art and try and sell their work that way because they all they all were great artists as well and so that kind of like was a wake-up call yeah and uh, then when we met richard we were like saw wow you can actually make a living at art and that opened our minds completely to the possibility of of uh because in chicago there were no galleries that sold anything like what we did so and what i didn't want to do this what year was this that year? i went, started going to the academy in 1985 yes nancy was in her third year when i was starting her third year when i started my first year and dan gearhart had just graduated the year before and rose was still there for a year uh but she would come to the palette chisel so we painted with her every every day 
at the pallet and chisel even after she finished school. And when we finished school, we also continued to paint the pallet and chisel every single day. And then Susan started at the academy the year after I finished. Mm. And we met her, and then she would come to start coming to the pallet and chisel and 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 you know painting all the time too. So yeah. And what what year did you graduate? Like 89? Oh gosh. I mean, I went there for three years. So I guess I didn't I didn't actually technically graduate. I I have uh I I know I have more than enough credits to have gotten an associate's right. degree because I went I also took classes in high school and that but I just when it came to graduation I was like Sue was the same way it was like why do I care if I have a I mean I don't want to be a teacher or anything I don't want to just paint I it's just it was it was like I think it was fifty dollars to, to do the paperwork and I was like. At that time, I was like, I'm not paying fifty dollars. You know, I, what do I care about graduation? So I never filled out the thing. So I, I have to be careful. I'm not technically a graduate of American Academy of Art. Um, uh, and it was funny too because Sue was the same way when she finished and she graduated. Or she, well, she had enough to graduate, and she was like, I don't care either. Who cares? Who cares about grades? Nobody's ever asked you. Even when I was in school, people would stress about their grades, and I wouldn't even open it. I was like. <laughs> if you think when you go somewhere to get a job yeah. at Disney or Hallmark or at a gallery, they're going to ask you what grade you got. Yeah. This is art. You know, it's not like you're going to be a lawyer or you know, have to, you have to prove that, you know, the material, they look at it in a second. They're going to know if you're good or not. Did you ever uh, look at the grades at all? I didn't look at the grades. I didn't bother to look at them. Um, they would mail them home. And sometimes my mom would say, Oh, you know, I was like, you know, and, uh, and, and I think Mr. Parks told me years later, he said, you know, you were the first person I gave an A to, you know, in first year. I was like, Oh, I didn't even know. And it, it, cause it, 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 for one, one of the, one of the semesters or something, but, uh, and Sue is funny. Sue also say when you told him, I didn't even know. He... Oh, well, he agrees. He doesn't care. He's like, he goes, like, yeah. he, goes, he goes, I know it's the stupidest thing in the world. He, he was in the same mind. And he's like, but I'm supposed to do this. This is my job as a teacher. But he said I, he was against. He thought it was a silly thing. And it was funny because Sue didn't also didn't apply to it. But we got in the mail. We were living together uh, a couple years after she graduated. And we were living together in Rogers Park. We got our apartment together, our first one. Um, she got in the mail, her her diploma or whatever. And she's like, where did this come from? I didn't fill anything out. She, and she found out her father found out that she must have made a comment to somebody or a sister or something. Who cares about that? And so but her father was so upset. He wanted her to have officially graduated his daughter. Right. And so he actually went there, filled out the things and and uh, paid the fee. And so she she's an official graduate. Right. <laughs>